All right. Well, why don't we get started? Uh, it's uh, essentially 7.30. It's a, a tremendous honor to introduce our uh, visiting professor, Dr. James Harrop, who uh, visited the Miami Project yesterday and gave a terrific talk on spinal cord injury and is going to give us a talk today on lumbar fusion. As he'll tell you, it's an award-winning uh, talk from the, the CNS. Uh, just a little bit of uh, background on Dr. Harrop. He's a professor of neurosurgery and orthopedics at uh, Jefferson, has been there his entire career. He actually uh, trained there, did his uh, general surgery and then neurosurgery at Jefferson, and then did his spine fellowship uh, with Benzel in, in Cleveland uh, Clinic. Um, he's uh, really, I, I would say, the smartest uh, spine surgeon I know. That's probably not saying much, but he is the smartest spine surgeon I, I know. Uh, he has uh, somewhere between 450 and 550 publications, an H index of 66. So it's not just garbage qual quantity, it's quality. Um, and um, he's been uh, teaching spine at Jefferson. Uh, a number of um, some of our faculty have gone there. We've we've uh, been had the opportunity to train some of his residents. He's been very involved in research, NIH funded, DoD funded, Picori funded, and has been very involved in organized neurosurgery, both at the CNS, AANS, joint spine section level. He is now just finishing his presidency of uh, the Cervical Spine Research Society. So uh, Jim has done it all, and we're anxious for him to share his knowledge with us. Jim? I only know it's 79 because one of my junior, one of my other attendings every day tries to beat me, and I'm like, someone told me the other day, and I didn't know this, your H index can't go down. Yeah. It cannot go down. So I'm like, so I peaked. I'll probably be the first guy to bring it down. All right. So thank you guys for all coming and being here and awake. I'll try to keep you awake. I like to say I try to entertain you. You might not learn anything, but I'll entertain you. Uh, by the way, Miami, you guys, you never know what you got until you don't have it. So your Miami project is fantastic. Your research arm, you know, your your chairman's probably a little lacking, but you got support underneath him. So it, it's it, it's great to be here. And we'll go through here. So what I'm going to do really quickly actually didn't bring my one. So just tell me when it's time to shut up. Uh, I'm going to try to go through, I got a master's and most people have a midlife crisis. They get a new car, a new wife. I got a master's. And so uh, I got a master's and it's very interesting. A lot of people got a master's in business and I, I was a math major and I wasn't that really interested in business. Hence the reason I went to med school. And I was looking around and this opportunity came up to get a, a master's in quality improvement. And it's really what we do as doctors. You look at a problem, you try to figure out what a better way to deal with that problem is, and then you fix it. And what I'm going to try to give you is just a couple little things that I learned in my in my master's, because what the big issue is, is what you realize in life is it's about a process. So you need to have a process for whatever you want to do. If something's bad, it's not some individual's bad. That's a cog in the process. You have to go back and fix the process. So we're going to go through that really quickly. And what I really want you to think about, because none of my residents do it, I am very interested in costs. How much does everything cost? How much does the yellow bipolar cost in the OR, Mike Wayne? He's going to go, I could give two shits. I hope. Is this being recorded, by the way? <laughs> okay. There's going to be a lot of bleeps out. <laughs> you, you don't, do you know how much yellow bipolars are? $500, that is correct. And so you should know what you use in the, in the operating room. Like, I won't let my residents use a, a yellow bipolar because I'm a spine surgeon. And I'm like, you don't need to use yellow bipolars. That's for the really fancy tumor doctors and everyone else. All right. So this is a take-home picture. This is the GDP in the U.S. and how much health care costs. The blue line is what every other country in the world does. The green line's us. And so what you need to ask yourself are we doing better care than everyone else? Answer, we like to think yes, but probably not. So one equation, if you're not a math major, this is the only thing you have to know. Value equals quality over cost. So in order to make the world better, you have to do either two things. 
everything you do in medicine, you should ask yourself, is this better quality or is this a lower cost? Because if you're doing one of those two, then you're improving the world because you're making better value. So here you're going to see there's a big gap. Every metric you want to look at in U.S. healthcare, births, children, death, poverty, nutrition, life expectancy, we are behind the rest of the world. And technically, we're not behind. We're just $4,000 more expensive. So if you look at this, this is life expectancy. Everyone else in the world is over there. We're way on the right. And it costs us about $4,000 per person in the U.S. for that. So we need to do something. And that's what I want you guys to do with your generation. And I'm on the value analysis committee at Jefferson for the whole enterprise. We accept almost everything. But what we do is we go back and we say, what are we getting for this? Is it a quality improvement or a cost different? And so we need to do that from the bottom ground up. All right, the boring part's almost over. Relax. All right, so here's a great question. Who uses lumbar orthosis? I know Mike does because he's cutting edge 1970. <laughs> for the lawyers. Uh, for so that's a good point. We can talk about that later too. So I just ask you, what is the value of a lumbar orthosis? Who wants to answer me? Anyone in the back? Mike, throw out a name. Oh, so oh, what, what, Four fifty. Well, that, that, don't forget, your hospital is going to jack that price up, so they're going to probably charge you. It's funny, you know, the cervical collars you guys give out, you know, the trauma patients cost about the hospital thirty dollars, and they usually charge about three hundred dollars to eight hundred dollars, which is just amazing. Anyway, so here we here we go. We need some, something to supplement Mike's Mike's salary. So here's your data: prospective randomized study, the best thing you can do for evidence based. You any value for you guys or the patient with the lumbar arthrosis? The answer is no. Where's my Canadian friend, the Vancouverite? Ready? Classic paper from the Vancouver guys looked at uh, A3 burst fractures and trauma. They showed you didn't need a brace when you have a broken back, but we continue to convince. And my, I'm I'm totally with you because I I use braces too. They continue to use braces. So really, we get nothing out of a brace. It costs more. If you talk to your patients, most of the patients hate the brace. And we need to get rid of things that don't do anything for us. So Jefferson, I, I, I've been doing this for kind of years and, and gone back. We use ventriculosomies, more expensive catheter to have antibiotic pregnant, good or bad thing. Well, it's actually a great thing because you don't get infections. And our infection rate went from like 6% to 1%, or it's almost zero now. And we did a bunch of other different things to make costs cheaper. What I'm really going to talk to you about lumbar fusions, and, and we're going to go through that. So I go to get my master's, uh, and you meet with your, your advisor, and I show up the first day, and she's a very nice lady from Connecticut. She actually used the uh, quality control for the state of Connecticut, and she comes down and gets to Jefferson and give lectures, and she's like, well, what do you want to talk about? And I, I got a couple ideas, and I'm throwing out there. And she's like, why don't you work on lumbar fusions? And I go, why don't I cure cancer, lady? Who the hell are you? And, and I'm like, I'm like this. That's like the hardest thing in the world because there's no data on lumbar fusion. And so to appease her, I did it. And then I started looking at things, and it got kind of interesting. So this is lumbar fusions, the rate in the U.S. going up. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Anyone? It depends, right? It depends if you get value for it. Are they going to get quality or are they going to get cost? And so the number of fusions has unbelievably outpaced everything, discectomies uh, and everything. And just so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not preaching to the choir here, this is Jefferson's numbers. Our fusion rates have definitely increased just like everyone's else. But Jim Weinstein, who is, is unbelievable, one of the first quality thinkers out there, he was the editor for Spine. He wrote this paper. And it's one of my favorite papers out there. So he did a map and he looked at 132 of the Medicare places around the country. Okay. And he just very simply, he looked at four different operations and he said, I just want to see the number of people in that area and the number of operations. And then he, he made a great a scale, right? So you should be one, which is going to be, you should be the purple box. That means you're one should be even. However, in the U S you have people that are five times more in the dark blue. So in an ideal world, if we're doing the right things for our patient, the map should be one color. It should be all purple because we're all doing the right things for the right people. And that doesn't happen. Now, 
interestingly, if you look at the hip fractures, what they did is they used a logarithmic scale and they put it on the right. You want to be one on the logarithmic scale, right? And so he looked at the Medicare places and put it up there. And hip fractures in the U.S. were fairly consistent. How you, you go in the hospital with broken hip, you're going to get fixed. It's pretty consistent. The ortho guys follow their guidelines. They do it. Hip replacement, a little bit more over the board. How about lumbar fusion? We are all over the board on how we treat people with lumbar fusions. This guy up here, I don't want to say his name. Could be Miami. Although if you look, Miami's not that bad. If you look down at the bottom of the, the map, you guys aren't that bad at criminals. It's actually, believe it or not, the Midwest is sort of place. And Detroit, if you go to, if you, if you get recommended a back operation of Detroit, leave because they have the highest rate in, in the country. But but this guy's a million times. I mean, just think about that. You're going to go in, the, in that hospital and you have a million times better chance of getting a fusion than anywhere else in the country. That's a bad sign. So I went around and I said, well, first of all, is that true? And so the only reason, the only way you're going to get consistency is if people follow the guidelines and there are guidelines out there for lumbar fusion. They're not great. And we'll go into that in a little bit. So we did a survey and I sent it out to a bunch of different surgery, to a bunch of people. And this exactly reinforced that we don't treat the people the exact same way. That's a very boring paper and it got published in the journal of unknown citations. <laughs> But it counts for my papers there, Alan. All right. So what's the driver for lumbar fusion, you ask? And I'm not going to get too in deep, deep into this. But whenever you do a quality project or you're doing a project, you should look at what are stakeholders and what are people's investments and what do they own? So the surgeon, patient, hospital, and payer, the th four biggest stakeholders. So in a surgeon, if you do something and you get a reward, you, you like doing that, and you're probably going to do it again. So an RVU is our, you know, our rat pellet, if you want to say. The problem is, is what happens if I decide to do a fusion versus a decompression? Anyone know how much more I get paid? A lot? It's about three times more. So you got to say it's probably not going to take that much, three times longer to do a fusion or whatever. So it's, it's, it's sends a cycle back from the surgeon that's probably not the great cycle we want of reinforcement. How about for the patient? Patient care doesn't, doesn't care what you do. They just want to get a good outcome. The interesting thing, if they get a bad outcome, what happens? They get another operation. So for the surgeon, that's not a bad deal. The hospital really doesn't care. They'd much rather you do a fusion. Why is that? Anyone know? They get paid a lot more. There's something called the DRG. And the DRG for the hospital is they get a much better global payment for the hospital. So they actually kind of support the surgeon doing fusion. And that's if, if you read the newspaper every now and then, you'll see some surgeon going to prison and the hospital system going to prison for something about kickbacks. We could talk about that later. And then the pair, they want you to die. So, I mean, they're, they're the easiest one. They don't want you to get an operation at all. We just talked about, anyone know how the average time you stay in a healthcare plan? Anyone? It's, it's four years. It's like 3.8 years. So insurance companies really don't want you to do anything in their four years. So they've figured out ways to delay you because it's like PayPal. If they can push you off, then they don't have to pay it. And so they've come up, we were just talking about Aetna is probably one of the worst. And I'm glad this is being recorded. They actually will, <laughs> they make you have physical therapy on every patient, even though it's irrational and the patient had it beforehand, they will deny surgery for that reason, just because they can say they have to do three months of physical therapy. And this is Jim Harrop's opinion is so they can push that patient off, hoping that they go into a different insurance plan because you guys don't decide your insurance plan. Like most Americans, your healthcare comes from your hospital, your employer. All right. So this is the big take home point. Who's getting ready to take their boards? Anyone? Bueller? No one? Strong prodigy you got here. No one's taking their boards. Uh, okay. I take it. No, actually, I took it out. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll leave them alone. Who's studying for their boards? Anyone? Who's awake? Anyone? <laughs> All right. I'm not going to torture you guys. So anyways, the, in 2017, they changed the way we do the boards. And what they do, they made it more like the orthopedic surgeons. And they make you do your own cases. 
And so I actually, I, I review for the boards. And so every, like I just did three different people where they send me their case log and I go through their cases and I look at them, I go, is this an indicated case? What is their complication? What is it? So this is the first time they did that in 2017. What do you think happened? Oh, it's unbelievable. It was like a, a massacre. The, the, the failure rate went up unbelievably high. And it wasn't just spine surgeons, to be fair. I mean, the, there were different things with aneurysms and other things. But it was the first time we looked at it. And it was one of the first times the failure rate went over 20%. And it became, to me, this was one of those, you know, they call it a burning platform, is we have to do something and me as an educator have to make sure my residents understand what the indication for a lumbar fusion is because you should not be going to the boards and failing your boards based on your indication because that's a horrible thing from an educator's point of view. So I said, okay, I'm going to make a, a bunch of cases. I'm going to send them out to my faculty, my residents. I think I made 30 cases and I sent them out and I said, and, I, and the funny thing is, I didn't think they were that hard. I'm like, okay, guy comes in, Alan. Lumbar discitis, six weeks of back pain, probably an IV drug user. We don't know. Kind of irrelevant. But what are you going to do? Uh, blood culture, ESRCRP. Biopsy proven staff. Biopsy proven staff. IV antibiotic, right? That, like, like that's, that's me and no brainer. And I've given this talk to other places and people are like, you're a criminal. You should operate on that. I'm like, there's no data. There's no data that you should operate on that. The guy's going to get better with antibiotics. Is that right, Mike? Oh, dear, there you go. Right, yeah. Always go to the guy with the nicest car. Go ahead. Now know what happened. I'm just going to make a comment because you're going to have more But the things that have grown I'm not funny. Here. I'm, I'm, I'm showing the data. Our physical therapy, injections. Ablation, everything is growing three X over fusion. So I think it's the entire. That's okay. Although I, I know you're going to focus on, I don't no, want the so, uh, No, no, I'm going to, I'm going to re refocus the group. So there's different, when you have an argument, okay, you got to go back to your parents. You're going to either, you're going to go logic or you're going to deflect. Mike did the classes deflection. Okay. It's not about, was it the right operation? It's like, well, you know, I robbed the store, but they robbed a bigger store. <laughs> Good strategy. It, it, it works very well. You want to find the argument? That is, it's fine. So, long story short, is there's no data that you should operate on if someone with a lumbar disc. So, I sent this out, and what do we get? I get all these people that say, "Oh yeah," a third of people said you should operate on them. Mike, you're not alone. Okay, and, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" I just my rest is going to. They're all going to go. They're all going to fail their boards. And then I said, the second question is, is all right. You're going to operate on them. Please don't fuse them at least. And of course, yeah, most of them fused them. So there's definitely a gap in knowledge and learning on what we should do for, for, for surgeries. This is just, I'm going to just go through this. So the problem is, is we don't teach, or I don't think we teach very well with the indications of lumbar surgery, and we don't follow the evidence-based guidelines for lumbar surgery. So I came up and I said, and I'm going to go through things really quickly. We got to do something. And the first thing I did is I looked out there for data. How many evidence-based guidelines for lumbar fusion do you think there are? Zero. I'll give you the answer. There's subsets for different parts, but there's not an overall one. And I'll go, I'll go yet. I'll figure out and show you how I uh, dealt with that. He, he, he did. But if you go through those, there's not a lot about fusion. There's about physical therapy. There's about... There's a chapter on, uh, go read them all. There's a chapter on uh, degenerative spondy, yeah. but there's not a chapter on other types. So a lot of fusions fall out. Trauma, tumor, infection, those aren't classified in his what to do with them. I'll explain in one second. All right. So when you do a, a quality improvement project, you usually do a threats opportunity. And I'm not going to go through these because they're boring as anything. I just want to show you guys and girls that there are things out there and it makes you categorize how you think of something. So if you've got a project and you're saying, I'm going to do a, op, you know, I, I'm interested in axial neck pain and I want to do a study on axial neck pain. You should, you should go through these things and do that. The second thing you should do is, is what they call stakeholder analysis. And we sort of showed that before. And this to me is kind of interesting, and I do it more than I used to, because you find out who's going to be against your project. 
i.e. Mike Wang. And so you need to have a answer for how am I going to neutralize Mike Wang? So you're going to exclude him from the study? Are you going to make him do something? You have to do something. So just it no, it makes you line your arrows so everyone's in the right direction. All right. So you need an outcome measure. What are you going to use? The good news is the Oswestry Disability Index is a pretty good lumbar spine outcome measure. It's been known forever. It's uh, it's easy to do. Anyone, you guys know what it is? What do you know what it means? So if I give you an access uh, uh, ODI of fifty percent, what does that mean? Anyone? It actually was set up by the Workman's Comp people for that person is fifty percent disabled, so they could use that as a metric to say we're only going to pay you half your salary, which is kind of interesting. But anyways, it's fifty. It's uh, ten questions, five points each, fifty points, and then you double it. And for me, I, I I didn't do that for the study, but whatever. The second thing is I use this on every single paper. I got the Epic to actually put it into my uh, Epic note. So now when the patient comes in, it goes right into my note. And it's the greatest tool in the world because I know, you guys know what MCID is, minimally clinical important difference. That means you need to get five points improvement on the ODI in order to make that patient better. I, I'll go in clinic and I'll see this lady and she'll have an ODI of two. And I'm like, lady, I can't make your life better than it is right now. And so I use it in clinic all the time. Because it's a very, it's a objective way to try to understand your patient in two seconds. The funnier other thing is you'll see the patient come in with the devil horns on their head and fran all over the place. And they rip the hole in their paper because they're trying to make their pain pattern so bad. And you go, um, your ODI is, is 100. And you're like, um, I'll never be able to help you. Because with someone with a spinal fusion, you probably should fall in the range between 15 and 35. So just in the back of your main, if someone falls out of that. And the second thing is substantial clinical benefit. If you get 10 points improvement, that's called a substantial clinical benefit. So what we did is we said, uh, and I'll go back to how we did it, but we said, we're going to look at our patients and we're going to have ODIs pre-op. Then we're going to get a six month ODI and we're going to call it a success if they meet the MCID, which is five points improvement and a failure if they didn't. Make sense so far, Brian? I mean, uh, Alan? we broke them up into different things. We figured one, we're going to look at demographics because those are really easy to do. Then we're going to look at the surgical variabilities and then we're going to use the fusion uh, and we're going to break them up into different types of fusions by different procedures. Specifically, we're going to look at, here's the evidence-based guidelines and I'll get to that in one second. Here's the ones that aren't. And that was just one of the different metrics we looked at. And then we're going to look at them all and we're going to see what happens. The guidelines I use was actually the lumbar fusion guidelines from NAS which is actually an evidence-based policy. And if you want to criticize me, here's your point. It's not all evidence, level one evidence, which is horrible because we don't have level one evidence. For example, pseudoarthrosis, this Casanelli paper is, is graded level two. It probably should be graded level three. There's only one paper out there that says lumbar fusion for, uh, for back pain after surgery. And some of the other, you know, they use, they actually use to support Lumbar fusion's trauma, which is very interesting because Kirk Wood's paper says you get the same result, fusion or not fusion with lumbar things. But it's a flaw, but we're going to take it because it's the best thing I could find out there. Yep. Well, we just put trauma into in a group because you got to remember this is elective patients. And so the elective patients, you don't see that many traumas, to be fair. Especially mass general. Mass general, why mass general? There's the traffic's too slow behind a lot of the injury. There's very little violence. I mean, but whatever. It's, it's a well done study, but highly selective. Oh, I get you. No, he was actually in uh, Kirk Wood's paper. He wasn't at mass general when he did that. He did it out in uh, wherever he was before, Minnesota. Huh? He wasn't mass general. Trust me, I know. We, we'll talk about that later. A lot of gossip there. Later, yes. Yeah. All right. So here's here's what it goes. Here's a patient came in, 69 year old person, degenerative spondy, grade one to two. My favorite operation. They the, to me, I'm like that person is going to do well. Got in their ODI went from 16 to two at six months. A victory. One of my few patients that sends me a Christmas card. It's 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 a good time. So that we get a substantial clinical benefit. That would be called a success. Now, here's the other side of the fence. 57 year old guy comes in with neurogenic claudication. 
exhausted all medical problems. And I sort of took this out of his operative note. He gets his surgery. His ODI actually gets worse by two points. And he had a fusion. And this doesn't follow the evidence-based guidelines because there's not a deformity or a foraminal stenosis that he needed to get decompressed aggressively. So we, we made this algorithm. I'm not going to torture you guys too much with this. Come through. And every Monday, and I still do it today, every Monday I show up and we go through every single lumbar fusion case for the week. And so I go through it. The residents have them out. And we go through the history, physical. We grade them. We look at it. And we categorize them. We put them into a database. But it's a, it's a great exercise for the residents. So this is a sheet we made for it. And we fill out the sheet with all the different patients uh, things. We go through it. We discuss it. And then this is the result. We 325 people. We took out 16 patients. Actually, two of the, three of the deaths were actually, they were um, cancer patients. Uh, six people lost to follow-ups and seven missing ODIs. So we started with three, uh, uh, 309 patients, and then we broke them up. Only about 10% of the patients didn't fall in the evidence-based guideline category. And to be fair with everyone, I was kind of loose on the categories on how I judged it because it's not, you know, you could say I'm going to do an aggressive foraminotomy and that's an indication to do a lumbar fusion. Can I, is this you or this is neurosurgery or this is neuroanalytics? This is only neurosurgery. Only neurosurgery. Only neurosurgery. Only neurosurgery. Yeah, I didn't think I could, yeah. I, the ortho guys have a different data. I mean, they'd be willing to do it, but they have a different database. They're not part of Jefferson, so they don't use Epic. And so it's it's hard to get their records. All right, here's a take-home message. So what happened? If you looked at most people, and this is actually a pretty good message that when you talk to people, 80% of people did well with the lumbar fusion. So when patients ask me, what are my chances of getting better? I'm like, you have about an 80% chance to get better. 16% got worse. And we'll take those out a little bit. And about 12% no change. Now, you got to remember, there's a couple bad things about the ODI. Now, if you're doing great and you get hit by a car the day before you come into my office at six months, it doesn't matter. You, The ODI is the ODI, and you get blamed for it, but surgery could be success. I had a couple patients, I'll tell you, I fixed their back, and then their hips went out. And so they needed to get hip operation. So their ODI went down, but they thought they did well from surgery, or they were lying to me. Uh, the second thing is, if you get patients off opiates, but their ODI doesn't go down. It's not a success, although you would consider it a success. So the ODI is not the greatest thing in the world with that. So when we pull out the when we pull out the uh, the patients that did well, it's actually kind of interesting. A lot of them did really well, which is encouraging what you want to see. And then when you look at the patients that did poorly, a lot of them did. Eh, they didn't do really well, but they didn't do really bad. I mean, we didn't wipe out anyone. Um, we did a couple people. So. If you go into the stats, who did the best and worst? Revision people didn't do as well. Would you expect that or not? You kind of expect that, right? Because, you know, we usually tell people every time you have a surgery, your chances of getting better go down. Uh, the people that followed the evidence-based guidelines did well. And then the other one was, uh, how about surgeons? Are you a better surgeon than your partner? Mike, don't answer that. I saw I saw Alan's post up X rays the other day. <laughs> the uh, the deal is this: is when we looked at it, it didn't matter who the surgeon was. It didn't matter who the surgeon is. And you know how long you guys sit there and you can you think about I'm going to do this from the front, the back, the side. X lift is better than T lift, which is better than A lift. Didn't matter. It really matters. And Fred Simeon told me this many many years ago. You guys don't know who Fred Simeon is, but he's like. It's the patient you operate that matters, not the procedure you do. And so if you go through that and look at it, this is the big message. These are, this is the total number of patients uh, with the results. And you can see the reason I think we did so well, a lot of them were degenerative spinal thesis patients, um, which you could argue with me, Alan, that is it really indicated to operate and fuse a degenerative spinal with thesis. There is some data against that or not. We could We could argue about that forever. The problem is 7% didn't. And then when you look at the people, when you pull them out, just if they follow the evidence-based guidelines or not, what'd you see? A huge statistical difference. People that follow the guidelines, you got seven points of improvement. If you didn't follow the guidelines, you got two points of improvement. I'm going the wrong way. I'm on.
this is so we did a multi uh, we did a multi uh, variable uh, multi variable regression analysis and what did we find the single biggest factor with a odds ratio of three that means you have a three times better chance if you do evidence based guidelines versus anything else. The other thing that was kind of good, if it was your primary surgery, you had a good chance of doing it. If you had a, a younger or healthier person, you had a better chance. Or, and it's kind of interesting, kind of makes sense. The higher your ODI is at the beginning, the better chance you have of getting better because you have more points on the scale to get better. Now, full circle, ready? Remember why I did this? I did this to look at the residents to see if the residents got smarter. And a lot of people say neurosurgery residents, you can't get smarter. But I took that challenge, and we actually did do well. Uh, we had a survey. They filled it out before and after they did it. But this is what I found fascinating. So if you look at this group, what happens is, is this is this is sort of a graph by year of the residents. So I started this three years beforehand. So if you were a PGY-1, you should be about a PGY-3, right? So the first year, people, you shouldn't, shouldn't be that knowledgeable. As you come down, the second years, third years got better and better. The fourth years, fifth years, and sixth years sort of gave me the middle finger. And they sort of said, I'm going into, <laughs> I'm going into tumor vascular. I don't care about this thing. I'm just going to circle whatever box I want because they're not that interested in spine. At least that's my interpretation of that. So I think, I think you need to get repetitive learning cycles for people to understand things. And that's one of the reasons why I continue to do this today with the residents, because if you get seven years of continuous feedback of this is indicated, this is not, it, you're going to learn a lot better. And I think that's all I have. Oh, so my conclusion, you guys know all my confusion. And I just actually, I wanted, I just want to show this picture here for Alan. Alan, this is what the newer prize looks like. It's a little nicer than the other, the old ones that you have. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do what? That was. And by the way, it, when you take it. Nice. So bring out the knives. I like it. Bring it up, buddy. I just want to. Oh, can you put the slides back up? Uh, you know what the funniest thing in the world is? The wise ass just asked me to write him a letter of recommendation. <laughs> so, so bring it on. <laughs> no, we got it. Can you put the slides back up? All right, go ahead. I ain't done nothing. Yeah. The follow up the six months. They what? So you check on patient six months on either initial procedure. Not long enough follow-up, doctor. Oh, dude. So, so by the way, dude, by the way, first of all, if you're going to come after me, have some literature. If you go into literature and you can read, first of all, you'll find out that the data shows that the six-month and one-year follow-up with lumbar fusions are the same. And I will get you the papers for it, and I will send you the reference. And since you didn't read my paper or look at the references on the paper, in the back of the thing, you know that thing, bibliography or references? If you if you go to the number on the thing, it'll look at, it'll show the papers I quoted. Next question. Well, it's six, it's six months. I mean, my point wasn't my. But that should wash out at six months. And so that's, we looked at six months and it wasn't, it wasn't, I was not trying to target surgeons, but people always say the biggest argument you have with people with evidence-based medicines. Yeah. I don't follow the guidelines, but my patients do great. And so my point with picking on the surgeons wasn't to pick on the surgeons was to say, it wasn't the surgeons. There wasn't one surgeon that didn't follow the guidelines or whatever. And it wasn't an individual. It was following the guidelines, not the surgeon, the procedure or whatever. Does that make sense? Let's go back to that 
Right. Yeah. So you don't interpret that as being a so you guys are picking the guys. I mean, well, for full disclosure, I know who the guys were, and I will tell you, I have the lowest, I have the highest success rate. So go ahead, trash, trash everyone you want. <laughs> I was four, if you want to know. So your conclusion is there's no difference in the surgeon's outcomes with regards to OBI. It's if you look at the in oxidants. correct. So one was nine point oh four and the other was five point two two. It's almost but the standard deviation is almost nine. Not the Jim, first of all, oh, I, I kind of threw that slide in at the end. I was kind of like, you guys attacked the surgeons. That's a great talk. I, I think that, you know, in Florida, the residents and fellows have seen it, that there's probably more bad behavior in parts of Florida than there is in Philadelphia. And, it's, and what you're doing is very important. And, you know, it has to be put in the context, of course, but I think having data and information is critical. But let me ask you about this board's collection period issue, because I think the residents and bells out here, all they hear is gossip, right? And you have an inside scoop. I'm not involved on the board. Dr. Levin can, because you do board course, right? But you have an inside scoop on the APNS side. So what happened with the board deposits, you said, is you had a board collection period, and at the end of it, the bad behavior started immediately on yep. day 366. And here in neurosurgery, of course, it's a little bit of a longer ramp up. But I think most people are thinking during their collection period. I've heard it a million times yep. after the collection period, bam, they're going to go crazy. Tell them about what, because the board is not stupid. It's like yeah. their parents, right? They're not that dumb. Well, what are they really planning? Because it can't just be that you're good, good for three years and for the rest of your life. Right. And so I think with the board, you're probably going to have to submit cases as you go down with your mock down the road. Or they're going to, or they're going to have to do something. And this is me speaking out, not the board. Or they're going to make you do outcomes or something to follow your patients. But Dan Presnick said that they have a way now that your board certified to just randomly biopsy anything in your EMR or pass any time during your career. That they have the ability now to say, we're just going to go look at Dr. Jamshidi like tomorrow. And then they're going to pull the data and they're going to look at it and say, look, dude, you're like right. I mean, have you heard this or not? I'm just I, I haven't heard about this. This aggressive. I, I, it'll be interesting. I'm actually going to the boards. I forget when it is. It's in March or April. You know I'll, I'll get the gossip for you, Ben. Basically, there was a guy who had been in practice for about 20 plus years who failed to take his uh, MOC, they have the prominence exam, um, and, and actually then failed the actual exam, which was a super simple open book. Yep. And they said, look, you know, we're, we're going to have to go back and check your cases, and we want you to put your last 100 cases to review them. And they were absolutely a board yep. as to what they saw. I mean, like what this guy was doing was just so far out of, out of the realm. And it, it's interesting that they decided to look at new graduates who are really the ones who are not going to be the crazy ones. And so I think it's critically important if we're really going to change behavior that you do need to biopsy people or at least have a, the threat of biopsy upon them so that, you know, people aren't getting teeth into the pelvis for, you know, a degenerative L5 that's like this. No, I, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I will tell you, this is for the residents. You you hear about the boards as, oh, my God, it's unfair. And it was a little, when, when we took the boards, the guys would just randomly take cases, and it, would, it was hell. They have canned cases that they use. They are consistent. They are extremely fair. And I don't know if Alan can applaud this or not, but they are completely fair, and they're thing, cases you see every single day. And me as a spine surgeon, I look at the cases, I go, okay, I, I think I could deal with that case. So don't freak out for your boards. It, it is it is well done, and they really try to be helpful for you. So that's the good news about the boards. Do you think it'll be more of a difference between academic surgeons and academic institutions and like other non high volume centers in terms of analysis? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, you know, it's a great question. I think Alan's sort of nailed it. It's like, you know, you have to think about it. You know, it's a great question. I think Alan's sort of getting to it to a different way. And, 
the problem with, you know, the, we do what we think is successful in a lot of times. And then there's that minority of people that are probably doing things bad. And the question is, we all want the same thing, which is a good outcome for our patients. And I guess my point is, is there's all this, there's data out there that says this is the way to be good for your patient. Why aren't we following it? And that, that's sort of my take home message. Use what you got. I will tell you right now, this does not mean doing things outside of guidelines is wrong. So that's not the interpretation of this talk. Doing things outside guidelines mean is, well, my patient's situation is maybe outside of the guidelines and I'm going to do this operation, which might be great. The patient that did the best, and I didn't include this in the craft, the patient who did the best was one of the ones in the non-indicated category. So, I mean, I think you have to look at it as of, okay, what am I going to do? And there's certain situations, you know, you do operations and you're not sure they're going to do that that well. Um, so I think it's good to communicate with the patients better. And I think, you know, don't take home from this is I always have to do evidence-based guidelines, whatever I do, because every patient's a, u- a unique situation. And a, guide- a lot of guidelines aren't built for the situations you're going to be in. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was, uh, I actually have it in here. It was 70, that's it. For unindicated, it was two points. And for indicated, it was up to about eight points. Any other questions from the residents? This is your chance to talk to a world expert. And- I won't be mad at you. I won't yell at you like I did the, att- the attending who attacked me. <laughs> So we, we, we do the, we actually, we did that a long time ago and we have been doing it. One of the projects I did was, is I actually, um, and Michael liked this one. We used to have our patients over different areas in the hospital and Jefferson is very interesting. That's, and we can insert a different word there, but the issue is when they look at your hospital, they look at your metrics versus something they call it. I don't know. Do you guys use this university, uh, Verizon database or the university hospital consortium. It's it's a bunch of universe things. And so they looked at us and they go, well, your length of stay is one day better than ever, than the mean for the university consortium. So we're not going to do anything for you. So we came to them and we said, listen, we think that if you build us a spine unit, we, we can do better. I can protocol everything, make a process for the patients to come through, get them up. You know, our patients get up out of bed post-op day zero and they walk around because everything is the nurses, you know, they get off the monitors right away. And we set this algorithm up and I wrote this paper up. And so we made a spine unit and we saved another day, a length of stay for the hospital, a day and a half we'd cut off, which they were amazed for. They just did it because the Rothman guys asked for it, but it it was, you know, going back to your ear rest thing is absolutely, you know, the better the patients feel. uh, We, we, we did that before we did the spine unit, but I think it gets you to your message. The patients come in, they get a protocol with, uh, I think, Celebrex and uh, Neurontin, and then they go through this pathway to get out of the hospital. So so that's been very helpful for us. I'll tell you the other thing we did, which it, really quickly, if you're looking to save money out, do you guys have an MSBOS or a, a blood? Like when a patient comes in for an op- operation, they automatically draw the blood and they put units aside? So I looked at I looked at that one day and I'm like, what do you guys do with this blood the day afterwards? And they go, oh, we throw it away because they can't use it in general pool. And so then I went back and I said, when was the last time we gave a L45 T lift to freaking transfusion? And the answer is almost zero. And so we changed our MSBOS. Like we don't get we everyone gets a type and screen but we don't save blood unless you're having a huge operation. And the hospital, we saved $3 million for the hospital just on on that. And I'll give you the last thing we did for an academic center, which was kind of interesting. So when you guys do an ACF, how many trays do they open? Oh, that's good. Like our institution, what they did over the years is they would just throw more trays on there. So they had like nine trays that would come in for a standard ACDF and we cut them down to two trays. How much did it cost to flash a tray? And it's about $100. And so when you think about eight trays, 
down to three, you're talking five, you know, you're talking about $500 times, we do 2000 ACFs a year at our institution. So, so, so did they incentivize the serve no. to cost share the, so All right. the state, the hospital will reward either the surgeon, the department, the residents, nope. there should be some kind of cross spot. So I'm going to give you another. So doctors are very bright. So I want to write this paper. And if anyone wants to write it with me, I'm more than happy to do it. But you're going to be hated by doctors. So how much do you get an RVU for using allograft? Okay. How much do you get for a cage? If you do two levels allograft, what do you get? Same, but double for the cage. See what's going on here? So I, as a surgeon, am now going from, I do a three-level ACF, I could make two RVUs, or I could make 15 RVUs by using cages. Okay? So you do that, you do good. Now look at the other side of the hospital. The hospital costs $300 for an allograft versus $5,000 for a cage. So we, as physicians are not aligned with the hospital in payments. That, that's going back to Alan's point. And so I've been trying to get the hospital to say, look at cost of care, let's do it, let's try to bundle it and reward the physicians for being, uh, for being quality mongers for their patient rather than trying to get the most RVUs. By the way, Mike, that's, that's kind of sad that you know that many RVUs. <laughs> was mystified by the presentation of m and m that they would put up for every month the case counts yeah and the case and i was and it just mystified me because i was like why are they caring about case count as opposed to uh contribution margin rbu whatever right and i talked to mike simon who's the chair of the clinic right yeah. and he said that's what matters the most and he said that the ccf cares the most about your case count I said, you mean like a carpal tunnel? He goes, yeah. He goes, because that's where the margin is for them. That the fusions lose money in their hospital like JFK here in Florida that will not permit any surgery to ever do in its rule. Patients have to be transferred out because they're going to be more than two levels of fusion. Really? And there's a surgeon in Jacksonville who's doing all these kind of belts where they kicked out of the hospital because that's the money we have. Because the DRG is the same as 34,000 DRG. That's and you're saying, you know, you're, you're putting $20,000 on hard rate on the biological. So they're losing money yep. on the deformities. Oh, I agree with you. Right. So what do you think this like where's this headed? The stakeholders, hospital, payer, companies, doctors, patients. Where's all this headed? I mean, I think we have to be so if you've noticed too, we've become more physicians have become when I started, I was my own cost center. So that means if Jim Harrop bought a pencil, it went to Jim Harrop's cost center. Jim Harrop, it was eat what you kill. Now I am an employee of the hospital. I get paid by my RVUs. I I actually just talked to the, the, we got a new CEO of the whole enterprise and we're going away from our views because I think it totally is, is wrong and it pushes physicians towards productivity and doing things instead of patient care. You know, you get no, nothing for doing academics. You get nothing for your community service. Uh, and so I think, I don't know if you guys have a different way you do it, but it's, it's, I, I am totally against our view. And as a spine person, we spine guys love the RVU system because we do very well. Right. well that All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>